brought to you by The Point. I'm Lee and sitting in for Liu Xi. In this series, we dissect stories that are making headlines around the world and talk to our guests to compensate for the missing pieces of the puzzle. So join us in real time by sending us your comments or questions via the CTTN page on Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, or Weibo. If you're watching this live on the CTTN app, Email us at the point with LX at cdtn.com. Let us know what you think. We air headline Buster on Fridays at 11 a.m. Beijing time, so do get in touch, and we might just read out your comments. Now, before we get to today's topic, the U.S. and Denmark cooperating to spy on European officials, according to a new report, let's look at some comments on the news. Now, Winston Cam said, hard not to laugh at this news, as Henry Kissinger once said, it may be dangerous to be America's enemy, but to be America's friend is fatal. Well, a wise man, I gotta say, and it's amazing how history is repeating itself. Now, Sudakar Swain says, Denmark is in the EU and is ratting out other EU countries. That's a big deal and unforgivable, isn't it? Well, they messed up big time, didn't they? You certainly don't want to be in their shoes now. Now, No Mainer said, I'm curious, will the EU sanction American and Danish officials like they have for Russian and Chinese officials? Well, you know what, Noam? I like to vote that too, although I highly doubt it'll happen. But interesting observations there. Thanks so much for your comments. Keep them coming. We love it. Now, this week, we'll talk about all these points and what the spy report means for trust and cooperation among allies later in the show. But first, the background. The U.S. National Security Agency, or NSA, partnered with Denmark's Foreign Intelligence Unit to spy on the leaders and senior officials of neighboring countries, according to Danish state broadcaster DR. Targets reportedly included senior officials in Sweden, Norway, France, Germany, including German Chancellor Angela Merkel. Now, Danish intelligence apparently even helped the U.S. agency to spy on Denmark, including its foreign and finance ministries, as well as a Danish weapons manufacturer. And that's in addition to cooperating with the NSA on spying operations against the U.S. government itself. So, how did they get caught? Well, you may remember whistleblower Edward Snowden, who first sounded the alarm on the whole NSA phone tapping and spying an ally scandal back in 2013. Now, Germany opened an investigation in 2014 to find out if U.S. intelligence services had indeed spied on the mobile phone of Chancellor Angela Merkel. But just a year later, in 2015, the probe was dropped since not enough evidence could be presented to justify legal action. But it seems the case wasn't closed for everyone. Following Snowden's alert, an internal investigation by the Danish Defense Intelligence Service was launched in 2014. And according to the investigation, which covered the period from 2012 to 2014, the NSA used Danish eavesdropping systems on submarine internet cables with Denmark's knowledge and agreement to intercept calls and texts to and from telephones of officials in the neighboring countries. And in May 2021, news of the investigation's finding made it to the hands of the Danish broadcaster and several other news organizations across Germany, France, Norway, and Sweden. They cited nine unnamed individuals with access to the investigation as their sources. And the uproar has been fast and furious across Europe. Now, French President Emmanuel Macron said, this is not acceptable amongst allies at a news conference following a virtual Franco-German meeting with German Chancellor Angela Merkel. And he added, I'm attached to the bond of trust that unites Europeans and Americans, and there's no room for suspicion between us. Merkel said she could only agree with the comments of the French leader. The two sides said they are now waiting for complete clarity on the matter and are requesting their Danish and American partners to provide all the information on these revelations and past facts. Former German opposition leader Peter Steinbrück, who was also reportedly targeted, said he considered the news a political scandal, adding that he thought it was grotesque that friendly intelligence services are indeed intercepting and spying on top representatives of other countries. Norwegian Prime Minister also said it's unacceptable if countries which have close allied cooperation feel the need to spy on one another. So, what about comments from the Danish and American sides? So far, Danish Defense Minister declined to comment on what she caught speculation about intelligence matters in the media, but she did say that this government has the same attitude as the former Prime Minister expressed in 2013 and 2014. Systemic wiretapping of close allies is unacceptable. The Danish Intelligence Service declined to comment on the report altogether, as did the NSA. Now, following the news, Sweden, Snowden, I should say, made this post in Danish on his Twitter account, 
saying that if only there had been some reason to investigate many years ago. Oh, why didn't anyone warn us? He added in another tweet, Biden is well prepared to answer for this when he soon visits Europe since, of course, he was deeply involved in his scandal the first time around, and there should be an explicit requirement for full public disclosure, not only from Denmark, but their senior partners as well. So far, the U.S. president, who is due to make his first visit to Europe since being elected, hasn't said a word on the issue. Now, Biden, who was the VP under Barack Obama at the time, is scheduled to attend a G7 gathering in the U.K. on June 11th. Matters of transatlantic trust and data sharing are sure to be on the agenda. The potential fallout between the U.S., Denmark and their European allies remains to be seen. But nevertheless, what we can say for this is that the news makes it harder to trust that the U.S. delivers on its own words. Reuters published an article in 2014 after Edward Snowden revelations titled Obama banned spying on leaders of U.S. allies scales back NSA program. It quoted a speech delivered by then President Barack Obama to address the uproar after the activities of the NSA were made public. At the time, Obama promised that the U.S would not eavesdrop on the heads of state or government of close U.S. friends and allies unless there is a compelling national security purpose. A senior administration official said that would apply to dozens of leaders. Obama also said, the leaders of our close friends and allies deserve to know that if I want to learn what they think about an issue, I will pick up the phone and call them rather than turning to surveillance. It also makes you wonder just how clean this clean network the U.S. keeps promoting. The clean network campaign that was rolled out during the Trump administration since 2020, U.S. officials have lobbied countries around the world to join the scheme to shun Chinese high-tech firm Huawei's 5G. Now, U.S. leaders at the time even claimed that Huawei's telecom equipment had backdoors, which would allow it to share intel with the Chinese government. Of course, up to this day, nobody, nobody has seen a shred of evidence in support of such allegations. So what accounts for the groundless accusations made against China? Well, maybe U.S. itself has been accusing China of exactly what has been doing itself. Listen to what Chinese Foreign Ministry spokesperson Wen Wenbin said about the news at a regular briefing on June 3rd. People have every reason to suspect that the so-called clean network, which has been proposed by the United States, aims to consolidate the monopoly position of the United States in the high-tech field, and it opens a back door for its unhindered stealing and shady activities. Will such a clean network project become yet another surveillance network, which is controlled by the United States? The United States should stop such massive and indiscriminate eavesdropping activities and no longer using national security as a cover in order to put suppression on innocent enterprises, then eventually return justification back to the world. And now just imagine what U.S. politicians would say or do if reports emerged of China working with a U.S. ally to spy on the U.S., not to mention the field day the media would have. Well, we'll ask our guests about it all after this short break. Don't go away. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Headline Buster brought to you by The Point. Well, we've got a great panel today. I'm now joined via Zoom by Mr. Glenn Carl from Boston. He's the former CIA officer and also Mr. Einar Tengen from Beijing. He's our current affairs commentator. Also in Beijing is Mr. Lu Xiang, Research Fellow at the Chinese Academy of Social Sciences. Great to see you all, gentlemen. So let's talk about this. Why don't we start with Einar first? Are you surprised to see this news, first of all? No, not at all. I mean, what you see here is uh, the kind of blurred lines that developed after World War II and the Cold War. Uh, on one hand, it's very clear what spying agencies uh, are supposed to do, uh, you know, disinformation, uh, active attacks. Uh, when you're at war. But the Cold War kind of blurred everything, as I said. And now you're seeing it. Uh, we've reached kind of post-hypocritical uh, world where uh, countries routinely do things and then accuse others of doing exactly what they have done or intend to do. And Mr. Carl, let me bring you into this because you can provide us the insider scoop here. I mean, what is the United States afraid of? What do the country want to know exactly? Well, George Tenet, who was the director of the CIA for a number of years when I was serving, put uh, the mission of the CIA and of any intelligence service 
but pretty succinctly. He said the job is to recruit spies and steal secrets. That's what an intelligence service does. Uh, rather than what our colleague just said, I would, I would reorder a little bit the priorities. Uh, disinformation is part of the uh, functions uh, that uh, intelligence services engage in, but the primary uh, uh, task the mission is to obtain information from other governments that uh, is not publicly available and that those governments don't want uh, others to know. So that's the mission. So it's, it's not a Cold War phenomenon, uh, although that shaped the priorities and the targets of intelligence services, of course. Uh, but including is, their allies, uh, closed allies in do. Europe. That's part of the equation. I'm sorry? But spying on allies, that's part of the equation. Charles de Gaulle uh, said, and he wasn't the only one to say this, it's a saying that I think goes back to the Romans even, uh, that a, a country does not have friends, it has interests. And uh, you're friendly with a country and co cooperate with them or collaborate with them on issues of mutual uh, uh, interest and agreement. Uh, and then you seek your own uh, national interests uh, when they diverge or they may. Um, for the closest ally the United States has had for 120 years is Great Britain, and uh, Great Britain has not hesitated uh, almost in any of that time uh, to uh, seek its own national interests by finding information or shaping perceptions of the United States as it, it sees fit. I cite that example only because the two countries are so close, but that's how uh, the world functions. It's, it's uh, only a scandal when it reaches the news, but it is a day-to-day -day reality. It's a political reality, some would say, but talking about interests you mentioned there, Mr. Lucien, let me brought you into this. What is in Denmark's interest in all of this? I mean, they're certainly gaining something in exchange, right? What's the calculation there? Uh, for Denmark government, I, I think uh, its intelligence apparatus uh, was bought by, by the US intelligence unit, uh, just like uh, NSA. Uh, we know it's a long tradition for the US to have a global network for espionage and uh, spying, uh, either by human espionage or by uh, technical means. So uh, I, 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 just like uh, Mr. Tendon, I, I, uh, I'm not surprised by the newly new new report but, uh, but i'm a bit surprised by the collaboration of the denmark intelligence uh, service uh, the collaboration of denmark with the united states because you know denmark is so close to germany to france and uh, if they help uh, if they help the united states to do the espionage it's a it's a, a, a great damage to the trust between uh, these uh, European countries. So the, the current situation is somewhat complicated, but uh, I, I, don't think, uh, I don't think the Denmark uh, uh, intelligence uh, agency will uh, suspend this kind of uh, operation. Well, do they have the option to say no though, Mr. Lucian? I mean, would it be consequential, you know, saying no to the state? Uh, it's difficult. It's difficult. Actually, after the World War II, you know, uh, no European country is political, fully politically independent. They are all under, uh, under the sway of the United States. They can uh, even, I, I can say that even if German government, uh, certain apparatus of the German government can, uh, can resist the, the request from the United States. Mr. Carl, if Denmark, if the country declined the request posed by the CIA, what would happen? Well, it happens all the time. I think the characterization that we just heard is, uh, is a, frankly, too dark uh, and darker than the reality. Uh, countries, uh, each country and, and each intelligence service will always, on every issue, um, make a very conscious uh, cost-benefit uh, calculation. What, and each intelligence service will always seek, always, that it uh, obtain a net benefit from any exchange with another country. Uh, that's, that's sort of one of the rules of intelligence. Now, it can't be that both countries have uh, more benefit than the other, but you have to make that assessment. So what happens is Denmark says, well, let's see, uh, we can obtain X, Y, and Z that we want uh, for ourselves from the United States and not from someone else, and they want uh, A, B, and C in return. 
And so you make that calculation. The consequences would be, if Denmark said no, that uh, it would go on a scale of uh, relative importance of the issue for the United States and for Denmark. Uh, and the United States might simply say, the CIA might simply say, well, fine, okay, because for the CIA, it's more important to have good relations with Denmark's service. Or they might say, this is very important. And gosh, if you can't help us on this, perhaps we won't be able to help you on something else. This is just how intelligence services interact. Well, Einar, what do you think about this, of what's being said there? Your thoughts? Well, uh, in all due deference to my uh, colleague, uh, I, I don't think this is just uh, merely a calculation. There's something called law. Uh, the CIA is, is, not, is prohibited from spying on its own people. And he well knows that. So this idea that you enlist other countries to spy on your country so that you can get around this prohibition is uh, you know, rather cavalier, especially at a time when Joe Biden is saying that the world needs to unite around a rule of law, around a morality. So it really strikes hollow that he's been caught red handed uh, during the 2012, 2014 period uh, when he was uh, also Obama was saying the same things. Uh, basically ignoring that. Now, remember, in 2015, when the first scandal, uh, first acknowledgement that they were uh, spying on uh, Angela Merkel's handphone, this was not for national secrets or anything. What they wanted was an edge in the negotiations. They wanted to know Germany's position at the UN on an, on, on an economic situation. This was not something that had to do with the security of the United States. It simply had to do with trade negotiations. So this idea that this is some, some sort of calculus, uh, cost-benefit analysis, all done in, you know, in the security of one's head, well, that's silly. The United States is the overwhelming behemoth of the uh, intelligence entity. They have the largest budget, the largest reach, satellites galore, technology galore. They've shown it. Uh, disinformation campaigns have been an important part whether you're talking about trying to un um, undermine the non-aligned movement, uh, the things that happened in South America, Southeast Asia, Africa, Russia, Iran, you can, the list goes on and on. So I, I don't, I kind of reject this idea that this is just a kind of gentlemanly uh, scholar's idea of cost benefit analysis. Breaking the law is breaking the law and trying to insist hypocritically that others follow rules and laws that you do not intend to follow yourself, that puts you at risk. And you mentioned the law, right, Einar? I just want to be clear here. Legally speaking, there isn't an international law, currently speaking, prohibiting political espionage. Is that right? That's correct. It's, it's neither legal nor illegal. Um, if, you're, if, if it's wartime and you're wearing, uh, you know, military clothes and you're spying, you'll be treated as a soldier. But if you're caught in civilian clothes, doing any kind of sabotage, et cetera, uh, then you'll be treated, quote, as a spy. And in most countries, spies are shot or hung. So, you know, the, the real issue here, if you want to get to get anywhere on this, is to start talking about the difference between war and peace times, between gathering information, which all countries need to do, all right, analyzing that information versus using intelligence as an active weapon, for instance, in disinformation campaigns. For China, they see this is happening with Xinjiang. I mean, it's no secret that Adrian Zenz is, um, you know, paid by an ent entity that was headed up by a CIA former head, uh, Mr. Casey. And that, that in turn mm -hmm. is supported by an organization, the NED, National Endowment for Democracy, which is directly funded and was created to do so by the CIA and the, and the government post the debacle that happened uh, during the Reagan administration when they caught red-handed uh, doing this arms for oil uh, situation. So this is not uh, you know, intellectual or anything like that, but there has to be some sort of understanding if, if you're saying that the United States and the world should stand for you know, a series of laws and morality and ways of doing things. If not, then, yes, go back to the jungle. Anything is fair. Mr. Carl, I'm keen to know what you, you think about this. I mean, should there be a change? To, should there be an international law against such a kind of behaviors? Uh, well, this would be the hope of, of every nation, uh, theoretically, is, of course, that all nations be law-abiding, that there be one 
international body of law that to which all uh, agreed and, and all adhered. Sadly, perhaps for all of us, that has never in history been the case. Um, what uh, Einar was just saying, I, it's hard to know where to begin because a lot of it is sort of a salad that is mixed up, confusing um, uh, domestic laws with international practices, international uh, intelligence uh, behavior with diplomacy, all of which are really related but distinct. Um, I can tell you without any hesitation whatsoever that uh, it is illegal for the CIA or any U.S. intelligence entity to conduct espionage on uh, American citizens or uh, entities, and that uh, if uh, ever uh, someone in the CIA or some office in the CIA used a foreign country to spy on uh, Americans, as was alleged, uh, that person would be prosecuted. That's simply the truth. Uh, it's, it's not, it is, a, it is a very, very serious uh, issue to do that. So that doesn't happen. However, the, the job of an intelligence service uh, is to, frankly, to ignore, to break other countries' laws in pursuit of uh, its mission. And that's just what happens. And Mr. Liu, I mean, what can these European leaders do, realistically speaking, other than just mere complaints? Oh, okay, first of all, I want to go back a little to the question about oh, sure, laws. Uh, it's, a, it's a paradoxical uh, situation uh, re relating to the, uh, to the laws against, uh, uh, against, uh, concerning uh, espionage. First of all, there is no international law uh, governing how to do uh, governing how to do uh, espionage, but uh, uh, for each and uh, every country, there is law, uh, laws against espionage, uh, espionage by other countries. So uh, it's important for each and uh, every country to have laws and its enforcement mechanism to, to do things against espionage. So uh, now, uh, uh, if we talk about Germany, yeah, Germany has a responsibility to, uh, to in, uh, make law enforcement. Uh, in its own country, to to do many uh, to do quite a lot of things against the uh, against the foreign espionage. So uh, the other thing is about uh, CIA's uh, uh, role in the uh, in the United States. I want to say yes. CIA uh, by law by U.S. law, CIA is not responsible for monitoring the U.S. citizen. But we know uh, there is another agency called FBI. Uh, FBI has uh, legal, uh, legal. Uh, uh, it's legal for SBI, uh, FBI to monitor U.S. citizens. So it's it's a uh, it's a division of uh, of jobs of of different agencies. And for NSA, I, I don't know whether they have a, have a boundary for monitoring either U U.S. citizen or foreign citizens. Yeah, they, they, they they, do. maybe there's a. There is no law uh, restricting their role in that. So it's, diff it's oh, a very it complicated. You know, intelligence world is a dark world. We don't know. Yeah, there are too many things that we don't know. It's complicated, it's messy, and what's also happening is that U.S. President Joe Biden is about to meet European leaders very soon, a couple of days. It's due to, you know, attend this G7 summit that's being held in the U.K. I mean, Einar, what do you think is going through his mind right now? Well, I, I don't think he's too much bothered by it. I mean, the, these are uh, embarrassing situations, as uh, Mr. Carl has said, uh, but they're not unexpected. I mean, it's not like he didn't know we were doing that at the time. Um, but, you know, there are prohibitions against uh, the FBI. It's called the Constitution They're not and laws. They're not allowed to violate them in the United States. So that's, that's not uh, the real issue here. The real issue, though, is that Snowden revealed that the CIA and NSA were, in fact, spying on domestically and illegally. And I still have yet to see who was going to jail. Instead, it's turned into a massive witch hunt to, uh, to find uh, Snowden as a whistleblower and claim that he's uh, somehow uh, imperiled national security when he was pointing out that national security was breaking the law. Now, in terms of being accused of throwing a salad bowl at my, my dear friend, I would say to him that there is a difference between um, wartime and peacetime activities, and that the intelligence agency, because of the way they deal with information, 
And we now are in an information world where cyber attacks can be just as deadly as physical ones, that they have morphed into a, a potent weapon of, their, of, the, of a different type beyond, quote, disinformation and spying. They are now can be in a very aggressive and use their computers and knowledge to disrupt other entities, other governments, other processes. Right now, we see that happening in the US. It is a real threat, but it is also seen as a real opportunity by governments. That should be addressed on an international level, and that's not a salad bowl. We'll see what <laughs> happened next. I'm afraid this is all the time we have left. We're going to have to leave it there. Thank you so much for joining us for this interesting discussion. Mr. Glenn Carl joining us from Boston. Mr. Einar Tengen joining us from Beijing. And also Mr. Lucian joining us in Beijing. Many thanks. And that'll do it for this edition of Headline Buster brought to you by The Point. Thank you so much for staying with us. We'll see you same time next week.